Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and global blockchain revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane and I'm here today with Manuel Araraus. He is the CTO and founder of uh, Zeppelin. Yeah, so Manuel has been on the show before, which was I think around two years ago, uh, to talk about a project called Streamium, which at the time got quite a lot of attention. Um, and he's been around the, the blockchain space for, for a long time. So thanks so much for joining us today. And can, can you just tell us, how did you first get involved in Bitcoin and blockchain? Sure. So, hey, Brian, thanks for inviting me again. It's great to be here once more. Um, I got involved into the blockchain space around in 2012. I initially read about Bitcoin through the white paper earlier in 2011, as I was in college studying cryptography and distributed systems. And I saw this paper online, which challenged all my everything that I was learning in school. And I took the paper to my to my professors and they dismissed it as as uh, nonsense. So that got me even more interested, but I only got into working with the technology like a year later with proof of existence where I, I was thinking about uh, Bitcoin and, and I had been reading and thinking about Bitcoin for about a year and, and I had this idea of creating a, a, web, uh, a user-friendly web application to timestamp data using the Bitcoin blockchain and that's how I got involved in the space. Yeah, I mean, I actually remember that. Uh, I remember hearing about proof of existence and, and your work that, uh, then. I guess that was 2013. I didn't know about Bitcoin in 2012. Now, one, one thing that stands out to me here is, so proof of existence is a non-financial application, but at the time, there's still so much focus on, you know, Bitcoin, payments, money. Why do you think... So were you from the beginning more interested in kind of other use cases besides payments and money than... Um... Yes. Yes, for sure. Uh, to me, in the beginning, Bitcoin seemed like a pretty weird monetary experiment. And I was, uh, at the time I was, I had really no knowledge of fi finance or economics. Uh, actually, I, I got to learn many concepts in these fields thanks to getting involved in Bitcoin technology. And I just saw Bitcoin as a, a cool, geeky technology to, to play around with and to try to hack. Uh, so at the time, I was trying to think how we can use this uh, amazing new data structure of, of the blockchain and this, this network uh, for other use cases other than just sending money internationally. And uh, from the beginning, I was really excited about anything that I read about uh, in relation to Bitcoin that was not financial or not just a, an economic transaction. Um, so from the early days, I, I followed the discussions around what, what, which transactions are spam or which are valid use cases of the protocol. Uh, this was what got me interested in uh, some ideas about getting data into the blockchain. Uh, and it was actually from an article I read saying that uh, some, someone was getting prayers into the Bitcoin block headers. That got me thinking, oh, there's, there's a way to get some extra data and maybe you can do something interesting. But yeah, I was interested in, in, in non-financial use cases of, of blockchain tech since the early days. And so pr proof of existence, for those who don't know, uh, basically the idea is, right, because since we have this timestamped lock and sequence of blocks that you can put hashes of documents in there so you can prove it exists at a certain time. Um, was there any actual usage or traction of that project? Well, in the beginning, it, it was pretty early in the Bitcoin days. So it was mostly, there, there weren't many applications where you could use your Bitcoins. So where people were just finding it and, and using it to try something you can do with Bitcoin other than playing on Satoshi dice. And so it was mostly early Bitcoin adopters and many of them sent me emails. I have a, a huge collection of emails from the early users saying, oh, this is amazing. Uh, this is a way to, to spend my Bitcoin in, in some 
cool cool new application uh, but after some months past, past uh, I started to see some real use cases of people like uh, time stamping their ideas or research papers or trying to simulate a, a kind of pay, a patent for their what what they were developing and then some weird use cases like um, time stamping their own DNA and that kind of things. Cool. And, and then you did you after that did you join BitPay? Yeah, I was after after I did proof of existence, I worked as a freelance programmer in the space for like a year. And that's when I met uh, BitPay's founders, uh, Steven and Tony at the Latin American, the first Latin American Bitcoin conference here in Buenos Aires. And I was excited to see that, that there were real companies. For me, the Bitcoin space was like very small and I was getting freelance work, but it, it didn't sound as, a, as an actual industry to me until I met all these founders of actual companies like BitPay. And I got really excited about joining a team and learning from other developers instead of just working on my own. And that's why I joined BitPay uh, with the plan of focusing on their open source uh, work like Copay, Insight and Bitcore, which was a great plan for me because it meant I could learn more about the technology, work on open source stuff and learn from a great team. And it was a, a great decision uh, when I think about it. Yeah. And, and then how did Streamium come out of Was that... Did that kind of grow out of your work at BitPay as well? Yes, kind of. I mean, uh, as part of, I, I was leading the de development of Bitcore, the JavaScript Bitcoin library. And we were designing like sub modules for Bitcore. One of them was a payment channels library uh, that was built on top of Bitcore. And in parallel to that, uh, here in Buenos Aires, we had something sort of like Bitcoin dinners, what we called Bitcoin dinners from uh, with friends from college. And we just got together and discussed about Bitcoin news and latest developments back when you could get together and talk about those things in just one dinner. Uh, and after some time of getting together to talk, we decided to, to build something. So we organized a, a hackathon among us, just friends from college. And we decided we wanted to build something with payment channels using the, the payment channels library we had developed uh, in BitPay. Uh, because it was a, a hot topic at the moment, but nobody was building applications with it. So we decided to finish the, the implementation and, and create a, a first application for payment channels. And we had this idea of live video and micropayments where you paid pay for each second via uh, the payment channels protocol. And so that was actually live uh, on Bitcoin or? Yes. Yes. And I'm curious, I mean, I guess that that is one of the use cases people often uh, mention in the context of Lightning Network. What's your kind of perspective of that? Do you feel like um, this could have, or how, how come this was possible without the Lightning Network? Oh, yes, I agree. I think Lightning Network is just, well, just, it's, it's payment channels, but uh, well designed. Uh, so I agree. And Streaming was just a, a really simple application. Uh, we didn't actually grow it into one. It was like more like a technical prototype or, or a very small MVP. Uh, and at that time, it didn't make sense uh, for us to continue development because it was very early in in consumer adoption of Bitcoin. So the market was really small to focus on, on streaming as a business. Uh, but I do think like live video is a, it's a great use case for payment channels in general or, or the Lightning Network uh, when, it's, when it's live. So that early work was of yours was all focused on Bitcoin or around Bitcoin. And, and now you guys are mostly focused and, and we're going to get to speak much more about Zeppelin in, in a little bit uh, on Ethereum. Were you from the beginning when the Ethereum white paper came out, like kind of interested in opening to that or did that come later? Um, more or less. I mean, I, 
I was part of one of the mailing lists where Vitalik presented the white paper, which is the, the colored coins mailing list. And at the time I thought this guy is crazy. Like he's, he's aiming too high. Like we can't solve many simpler cases with Bitcoin. Why, why is he thinking about this crazy Turing completeness for smart contracts? Like we still need to figure out simpler cases. Um, so I followed him because, I mean, I followed the, the white paper development back then and I read and I commented, but to me, it seemed like uh, solving a non-existent problem. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I was wrong. And some years later, I revisited uh, his work, uh, and which is basically Ethereum. And I found that it was really amazing technology. It took me many, many months and many people I respect telling me, hey, you should look at Ethereum again. It's really good. Uh, if you like smart contracts, you should be looking at this. Uh, and after many people told me this, I said, OK, I will take a look again. Uh, but I must admit that initially I, I was very Bitcoin centric and I didn't like any altcoins because I was like, I was uh, tired of reading ideas of altcoins that seemed to be kind of scammy back then. So in my mind, I blocked many, many opportunities to learn about new technologies, unfortunately. But after I, I took a, a deeper look at Ethereum, I was convinced that it was interesting and worth looking at. And that's actually when we started uh, working with Ethereum uh, with Zeppelin. Yeah, it's interesting though how you have this revolutionary new thing like Bitcoin and then people get involved in it. And obviously these are all people who you know, question the status quo and like are kind of original thinkers and do things differently. And then somehow over time, right, many of us or many people kind of become like almost conservative <laughs> in the same way that those others come conservative and somebody else comes to question their work and like, no, no, this is like, I mean, I think in the Bitcoin community, right, this is extremely common. I, I can explain why I was that way. And it, it, uh, it relates to this what I was saying that I, I started seeing other uh, cryptocurrency projects and I got uh, disenchanted because they were all very similar to Bitcoin and they changed really little things. And I eventually got bored and I realized that like the best developers were working on Bitcoin and that Bitcoin was like advancing the industry. So I kind of shut off all the, all the noise from altcoin development for a while because I thought it was a waste of time. But after some months of shutting it off, uh, some, some of it came through uh, uh, in, in the form of uh, people I, that I respect that were saying, hey, you should look at this new coin. This is interesting. Uh, and that's when I kind of opened my, my mind again to, to new projects. And, and even today, I see some people are only focusing on Bitcoin. And I think that's very like narrow sided. But I understand them because I, I felt the same a couple of years back. Um, and it still happens that many like cryptocurrency projects are kind of uh, smoke selling. I, I don't know how to translate this from Spanish, but like selling smoke and mirrors. Uh, like it's not actual tech. It's just a new logo and very similar ideas. Uh, but I'm but fortunately, there's many really interesting projects at the moment outside of Bitcoin. Yeah, no, I totally understand. I actually have a, a somewhat similar uh, situation today, you know, with all these new ICOs and stuff where, I'm like, where, where I tend to kind of be like, oh, there's like too much and the, 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 there's so much noise versus good projects that it's like it's not even worth looking at it. Um, and of course, that's dangerous too, right? Because, well, let's... I'm sure among all the noise and all the questionable projects and all the smoke and mirrors, there are also great new ideas, great new teams. Exactly, yeah. So then you guys started working on Ethereum and it sounds like, I mean, a lot of your focus is on, on security. Why focus on that aspect? Yes, so let me backtrack a bit there. After Streamium, we decided to, to start a company with my partner. Uh, and to focus on when we realized the, that streaming as a business was not a, a, a great idea because it was too early to require our users to own Bitcoin back at the time. Uh, there were very few uh, Bitcoin users 
back then. Uh, we still wanted to sort of continue with the momentum we have we had and to experiment with uh, what excited us most about uh, blockchain, which was smart contracts. So we started Zeppelin, which at the time was called Smart Contract Solutions, which is a really generic name exactly because we wanted to be generic and to explore use cases uh, and the technology of smart contracts. Um, and after experimenting for like a year on many applications, we realized that the biggest problem uh, that, that we had was that the tech stack was really immature and really early. Uh, so after seeing that we had this problem and we realized that many other developers had this problem, we decided to shift focus from trying to find a, an application to trying to build the tools to enable other developers to, to create applications more easily. And the biggest problem we saw in the space back then was security. It was around the time uh, the DAO hack happened. And we saw that the potential of creating amazing applications uh, was there with Ethereum. But the biggest hurdle at the time was that the tools were not very good and that developers were starting their projects from scratch, which led to uh, critical bugs, which led to hacks and stealing money or locking contracts or very disastrous scenarios. So we decided to launch Open Zeppelin as a, an open source and community effort to try to tackle this problem. Uh, and since then, we've been focusing on security, which is, uh, we think, one of the cornerstones of, of blockchain projects. Because if you, if you can't get your smart contract to do what you intended to, uh, then you can lose money or you can lose other people's money. Uh, as you know very well, I imagine. Yeah, so I read a post by you, a blog post, and, and of course that we'll link to it in the show notes, where you had this figure which I thought was mind-blowing that you, you said that among those early contracts in Ethereum that were holding substantial amounts of funds, 50% of them got hacked. Is that, is that accurate? That seems incredible. That, that's a, a, not, not a very serious statistic. I did like just manually looking at, at uh, projects that were interesting in the space or that had lots of transactions. Uh, it's not a, a real survey, but it, it, it's, it's the, the sense I got from sort of doing my research on the industry back then. Uh, and the, the tip of like the, 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 the greatest ex, uh, exposure of that was the DAO hack where suddenly like $50 million were lost to a hacker. Uh, and what we saw was that I think, I think the DAO was a great idea, like the concept of modeling a fund and having anyone invest and anyone vote and have voting rights on which projects the fund should invest in is a really great idea. The problem was that the tools were not there to, to develop such a complex smart contract in 2016. Uh, but I still think it's a, it's a great idea and that we should try to do it again with better tools to ensure security, not only at the, like the code and technical level, but also at the mechanism design and game theory level. Uh, but the industry has moved forward a lot since then. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, back then, what, what, what were the, those big mistakes that people made that caused all these gigantic losses? Like, why is it so hard to make smart contracts secure? Uh, well, it's, it's funny because many were really silly mistakes that had to do with uh, not understanding the Solidity language in depth. Unfortunately, also back then, Solidity was not very good of a language for handling money. And it has improved a lot since we launched Open Zeppelin. Um, also, Ethereum as a platform improved quite a bit. Uh, but we saw like silly mistakes in how to use uh, the language that led to catastrophic losses, or also some quirks in, in how to use the platform. Uh, some, some very famous cases I can try to explain uh, like this are um, a contract called Rubixi, which 
uh, was like a, a pyramid scheme modeled as a smart contract. Uh, and the contract originally was called uh, Pyramid DAO or something like that, Pyramid Contract. Uh, but before deploying it and before sharing the code with the community, the developer thought he didn't like to have the pyramid name in his contract, so he changed it to Rubixi, which is more puzzling. But when he changed the contract name, he forgot to change the constructor name, which in Solidity means that it, that is now a public function that anyone can call. Uh, and that cost uh, that anyone could call the constructor and take ownership of the, of the contract. So this is really basic stuff. Um, and it also relates to the fact that once you deploy a smart contract, the code is uh, immutable, uh, which is which is a, a is still a big problem because if you find a bug in an already deployed contract, it is a it is a quite a hassle to to fix it or to migrate your existing contract and data to a to a new fixed contract, um, and it's one of the problems we're actually trying to tackle with our newest project, uh, Zeppelin OS. Um, another, another kind of mistake that I can remember from back then uh, was incorrect use of, of the send primitive, which is a, a primitive in Solidity to send money to, to another address. Basically, that enables some code execution on the side of the receiver, and many problems arise, arose from that. Um, Actually, the DAO hack used this idea uh, and the fact that you could re-enter the original uh, code calling you uh, to steal funds. Uh, but if, if you look back, it's, it's mostly basic programming errors or basic uh, misunderstandings of how uh, programming patterns should be used uh, in, in financial applications. But Fortunately, uh, the, the platform and the, the community uh, advanced a lot and we built lots of standards and, and good practices around smart contract development that enable this kind of errors not to happen again. Uh, in part, uh, work like Open Zeppelin, which is a, a set of modules where you can just reuse already audited code and you know that at least part of your application is, is correct. Uh, and also the Solidity language improved a lot. They added some keywords and, uh, and also the EVM evolved, uh, adding some new opcodes that enable safer, safer code execution. Uh, so the, the state of the industry right now is much better than a year and a half back when we started Open Zeppelin. So that, that brings up an interesting point, right? So you mentioned EVM and Solidity because many people have claimed that or kind of made the case that some of these uh, problems and some of these security holes and, and hacks that have happened are kind of a you know a result directly uh, of the nature of Solidity and the EVM and that there's something kind of fundamentally unsecure about that approach and and of course there are projects like you know Tezos for example that I think is very strongly informed by this thesis to say okay it needs to be totally different we need to have some kind of functional programming language um, what's what are your thoughts on that yes I think those are very valid points uh, and with with every as with every security problem, there are many, many layers of, of causes. Uh, and I think Solidity and the EVM design, like even the fact that Ethereum is Turing complete, is kind of a, 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 a way that increases the, the attack vector for smart contracts in Ethereum. Uh, but security is always like a, a, a compromise between uh, how, how much you can express with the platform or with the tools you are, you are, you're using and, and how restrictive you want it to be to prevent programmer errors. So I tend to have a, a more, uh, what I, what I, what I like to think is a pragmatic approach, which is, uh, let's focus on what developers are using and try to improve the experience there. Um, I think it's very valid to try to build better tools like, uh, I, I'm not familiar with the details of what Tezos is building, but people that are working on new languages, 
uh, maybe functional languages uh, or, or even new smart contract platforms that have a, a different approach to security. Um, but we, like me personally and, and Zeppelin as an organization, we like to focus on what everyone is using and trying to improve the security of that. Um, because sometimes it's, it's really hard when, when a platform is already very pop popular and has a lot of adoption to get all, all, the, all the developers to move to a new platform. So we try to be more reactive and just focus on what is, what is most used and try to, to make it better. Yeah, I mean, you're certainly right that it will be, I, I, I think that's one of the huge challenges I see for Tezos ahead is, first of all, uh, of course, they don't have uh, an existing developer community and then a lot of these tools that may well make smart contracts much more secure, also just much more um, arcane, right? Nobody knows these languages, uh, very f much harder to learn. So I think that's going to be very hard to get people to, to switch over to that. Yes, and we're also ready to, if we see a new platform or a new language or a new technology or a new tool that is ga gaining in popularity, we, we will look into that and try to to collaborate on making that more secure and, and easier for developers too. We are not like tied to Solidity and Ethereum uh, by any means. So you have learned from your uh, exactly. being uh, stuck with Bitcoin. You mean. Yes. Otherwise, we would still be working just with Bitcoin and smart contracts in Bitcoin. So you mentioned Zeppelin before, so let, let's kind of dive into that. So you said it was a kind of a set of modules that came from your guys' experiments and kind of playing around with smart contracts and kind of abstracting some rules. Can you share a bit more about how Zeppelin evolved? Sure. Um, when we started, we had built some small projects uh, on our own, uh, many doing smart contracts in Bitcoin and some initial experiments in Solidity for Ethereum. And that's where we realized that we wanted to build like a, some kind of framework to make it easier for other developers. And we saw this potential, the potential of Ethereum and that it was gaining popularity. So we decided to focus there. And we launched Open Zeppelin with really basic stuff like some helpers to, to enable um, sort of protecting your contracts from common mistakes, uh, like very basic uh, ownership patterns or some payment patterns like the, the pool payments uh, module that, in a, that protect you from re-entrancy cases. Uh, and it was really, really simple in the beginning. I think less than eight contracts were there, uh, but we launched it and it, it got uh, some attention from developers that wanted to contribute to a common cause and to improve the, the ecosystem. And after that, we spent some months working with like consulting clients. We just did development for projects in the space that liked our approach uh, to Solidity development. Um, basically what we did is uh, we worked with the clients and we said, okay, we can develop your smart contracts, but you need to agree that we can use the code for Open Zeppelin. So most of the initial code from Open Zeppelin comes from those kind of uh, consulting gigs, which meant that uh, that code was actually being used in production. So the code in Open Zeppelin in the first months was just real code that was in production and that we had developed for real clients that wanted to do smart contracts. Uh, and after we got it started with this initial traction, we, we, we found a community of amazing developers that wanted to contribute their time into advancing the, the framework. And, and at the moment we have lots of, of contributors and lots of external collaborators and maintainers. Um, but that, that's how it got started. So is Zeppelin today kind of the most comprehensive um, set of uh, Ethereum libraries? Yes, I think so. Uh, it's, it's certainly the, the most used. I know there are some uh, sort of competing frameworks uh, are arising in the, in the ecosystem, 
I haven't looked at them in, in much detail, but um, we certainly have the biggest community and many, many projects in the space are using our code. 25% of, of the, no, even more, maybe. Well, I, I don't want to throw numbers if I can't check them, but uh, a big chunk of, of the projects we get as incoming audit requests are using Open Zeppelin. Like we, as part of, af after we launched Open Zeppelin, uh, many projects contacted us to get their code audited by us because we were focusing on security and we were generating content on how to program uh, smart contracts securely. Uh, so probably the developers reading our content were uh, want, wanted us to look at their code to give a, a final check to, to their security. Um, and that's one of our, our main businesses right now at Zeppelin. Uh, so we receive lots of requests every week of auditing smart contracts and a lot of them use Open Zeppelin. Cool. So, so how big is your team today? And like, how many of these security audits are you guys doing? Uh, the, we are 12, mostly in Buenos Aires, but some of them are remote. Uh, and we're doing around four audits per week. Wow, that's, uh, that's quite a volume. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we publish some of them when, when the projects and the teams agree. We publish them on our blog. Uh, so we, we like to, to make them public to, to allow other developers to learn from everyone's mistakes. So if you check our blog, uh, you can find many audits and learn about the latest security practices and what common mistakes appear on smart contract development. And so there's Zeppelin, right, which is on a community, right? And you have a kind of a set of modules and libraries. And then there's also Zeppelin OS. Um, what's the difference between Zeppelin OS and, and those tools that we have so far spoken about? Sure. So Open Zeppelin is the Solidity development framework. And in the past year, by working with our audit clients and with the community on building Open Zeppelin, we found that there are some uh, pending challenges that cannot be directly solved just by a framework like a library because Open Zeppelin is just code sitting on GitHub that you can download, uh, compile your project with and just uh, deploy your contract with. Uh, but there are some pending challenges that cannot be solved merely by, by a library. And last year we started thinking about uh, starting this, this new project, Zeppelin OS, which can tackle this kind of uh, greater challenges uh, in the space, which are also related to smart contract development and security. Um, in particular, we one of one of the pending challenges is uh, what I was describing earlier about how to fix a bug in production. Once you have a smart contract deployed, uh, given the immutability of the Ethereum blockchain, you cannot change the code after the fact, and that's very bad as a smart contract developer because you can find a, a really simple bug that has an easy fix and that could be critical to the uh, correct uh, behavior of your contract, but you cannot fix it. Uh, so that's one of the, of the problems we're trying to, to tackle with Zeppelin OS, which is how to upgrade your smart contracts once they are in production. Uh, and this had a, has a lot of implications and spawns a lot of discussions um, because it's not easy to uh, maintain sort of the, the balance between security and uh, trust from your contract because you don't want anyone to change. I, I mean, you don't want the developer to change anything they want, but you want them to be able to fix bugs. Um, so we for the upgradability mechanism, we designed a, a governance system where users of, of these on-chain libraries can decide and vote using uh, special tokens for the system uh, and decide which versions of, of the code are the most secure and the, and the, the correct versions. 
Yeah, so so let's say I I have I start some token sale. Now there's a lot of owners of these tokens, and there's some kind of bug in a critical contract there. Uh, and you're saying that kind of the Zeppelin OS approach is that then there is you have a bunch of tools that they token ho someone can kind of vote on okay this is a better version of this contract so let's replace this bug and let's replace this contract would then you know just kind of your library or, or this zeppelin os kernel allow the, you know the existing token holders of that contract to fulfill that function or would that be a separate token that's that's one of the goals but initially our approach will be a uh, less uh, involved for smart contract developers. Developers, Our initial proposal is to uh, have a, an on-chain version of the contracts we already have today on Open Zeppelin. So the development of Zeppelin OS will be iterative and we will improve it uh, in the coming months. Uh, so the end goal is what you described, but in, in the meantime, like uh, we are building an, an on-chain set of libraries that can be upgraded. So what what is upgraded is not the actual application code, but the library code that we provide. So if if anyone using our libraries finds a bug, uh, we can use this governance uh, mechanism for the upgradability uh, to fix the bug, and that fix can can propagate to all the applications using Zeppelin OS uh, as a kernel. Um, but eventually we want to provide this same mechanism for applications so they can upgrade their own code uh, using their own token voting and uh, vouching mechanisms uh, as we do for the library. So let's say I'm uh, developing some smart contract application and I want to use one of your uh, one of the functionalities that are in the Open Zeppelin framework is and you know so I, I could either just you know just take that code put it in my contract deploy it on ethereum or i could say i de deploy that my application on ethereum and i call that that function that's on chain like which one would you choose i mean i, I understand is it is the um, ability for the zeppelin community to upgrade the function and fix box is that the main selling point Yes, that's the, the main value add of the kernel, I think. You can still you still have the option of deploying just your own copy of Open Zeppelin as a library, but then you cannot uh, upgrade it on chain if you find a bug. The the additional value provided by using Zeppelin OS kernel is that any bug that the community finds on on the deployed version of the kernel can be upgraded via this governance upgradability mechanism. And uh, as, a, as a user of the kernel, you can decide whether you want to upgrade to the latest version automatically, or you want to just have manual control of which version of the kernel you're using. And in this way, you, you retain control of which code your application is running, but you also have access, like opt-in access to upgrades that can fix security problems. Um, and this is a like this this solves a real problem of the industry. We recently worked like last year we worked with the Ogre team in migrating their rep token after we found uh, a critical security vulnerability uh, caused by them using Serpent the Serpent language, which was very broken. Uh, and it was a lot of work to migrate the contract to, to a new version. We had to uh, freeze the old contract, contact all the exchanges, all the wallets. It was like a, a 10 day uh, project just to migrate the token to a new address with the fixed code. And it was the full Augur team and the full Zeppelin team working on this for 10 days. And it cost a lot of money uh, also to migrate the data. Uh, so all this would be prevented uh, if a uh, rep uh, had been built on top of an upgradable set of libraries. It would just have been uh, a deployment of a new version of the library and voting 
of, of the new version by, by the token holders. And we've seen many, many other projects uh, get into trouble because they found bugs in production. So it's a, it's a real need of, of the industry. Now you mentioned the token here and how the Zeppelin token is used to, to upgrade those Zeppelin contracts that live on chain. Where does the co token come from? Uh, who has it? Um, and, and how, yeah, so how does that work? Yes, so this is a, it's an upcoming uh, token. It's, it doesn't exist yet uh, because we want to create uh, an initial version of the kernel be before we launch the token. Um, and it, it, this token will be used uh, not only for, for the kernel upgradability mechanism, but also for other, other components of Zeppelin OS. Uh, so far we have discussed only the kernel, but we also have uh, other, other parts planned which are the smart contract development kit or the SDK and, and the Zeppelin OS marketplace. And this same token will be used in, in these other components, especially in the marketplace. Um, but we, we, we are not planning to release the token until we have a, an initial version of the kernel working, which requires the token. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why uh, we we are not doing like a public crowd sale of the SEP token. Uh, we we want to have a, a working prototype with actual users before we we launch a, a token, which is a huge responsibility. So yeah, I think that's a good point. Let's let's actually come back to the token in a little bit and briefly talk about uh, these other two parts. So first one being the SDK. What is the Zeppelin OS SDK? Sure. So uh, the SDK is response to another need of, of the space, which is better contract development tools. This involves on-chain tools, um, which I can expand on in a minute, and, and off-chain tools like uh, web applications to manage and uh, monitor your contracts, like what, what, what we like to think as a a uh, Heroku for smart contract developments or for decentralized applications where you can, on a single web application, see your contracts, uh, perform operations on them, like upgrading their code or changing ownership or changing the, the state variables directly from, from a web app. Um, and also developer tools like command line interfaces or testing if frameworks. So we, we want to build uh, a better development environment uh, around smart contract development. Um, and this also involves on-chain tools like what we call the Zeppelin OS scheduler, which is basically a set of tools to enable asynchronous execution in smart contracts. And this, this would give, like right now, any, any interaction between contracts is done in the context of one user transaction. So a user needs to, like a, a real human or, or, a, or, a, or an application needs to initiate a transaction, but all the interactions between contracts that are internal to that transaction are in the context of that initial uh, one transaction. So it's all like synchronous calls. With the scheduler, it's basically a, a way to, to enable smart contracts to execute asynchronously and enable calls that uh, can react to external events from the world or just delay execution of some function to, uh, say, two months from now. Uh, and this is, this is uh, some really simple tools that will make uh, smart contract development easier. Uh, and we decided to focus on the kernel first because it solves a more basic problem of the industry, which is like fixing bugs. Uh, but once we have the kernel in place, we're going to work on the SDK uh, with, with the basis of this uh, secure kernel. Once you have simple secure contracts, we can work on, more, uh, on, on better tools to create more complex contracts. And the third phase is the marketplace. Uh, because we think that once we can create complex contracts, the next step in, 
increasing the usefulness and complexity is via interaction of, of the contracts. So the marketplace is basically a set of standards uh, and tools to enable contracts to interact with each other and pay for each other's services. Um, uh, but this comes later in the roadmap because we think uh, upgradability and better development tools are in more, in more dire need uh, for developers today. So, so just l let me give one example, uh, and cur please correct me if I'm wrong regarding your scheduler, maybe to kind of illustrate what this is about. So let's say we had some kind of organization on the chain that's owned by different people, and then it pays out, let's say, quarterly dividend, then you can't actually have that contract sent that out at the end of each quarter, but maybe it would have some kind of functionality that it becomes claimable by the user and they have to send a transaction to actually get that money. Uh, and, and then with something like a schedule, you could actually have that contract itself initiate that transfer. Is that correct? Uh, it is correct in how it would work, but actually uh, it's, a, it's a platform limit that every operation of a smart contract has to be initiated by a user. So that will still happen, but the scheduler is a set of uh, development tools that you include into your contract. And it's also uh, off-chain tools that anyone can, can run. So the scheduler is um, a smart contract that wants uh, execution, say, at the end of the month. They can signal this to the network by emitting a special event where they say, I want this method to be executed by the end of the month. And the network of uh, that is looking at these kind of events uh, they can decide. Okay, I want to. I want to call this contract later in the future, in in exchange for a bounty. So instead of uh, having the actual user of the smart contract pay for the gas cost of executing, you can sort of decouple who pays for the gas cost, and and at what time. Uh, so basically, there's there's a network of nodes looking at the blockchain for these events. And when the time comes for the contract to be ex executed, any, any of them can choose to actually do the transaction and get a bounty uh, in return. Okay, cool. And now the marketplace, so, so you said it's about allowing contracts to kind of call other contracts and pay them for it. Can you give some examples of that? Sure. So this is, these examples will sound uh, maybe futuristic, and it's because we don't see many interactions between contracts today. Um, but we think about Zeppelin OS as solving problems in the next five to 10 years in the industries. That's why we are planning so far ahead. Uh, but think about developing an application, uh, for example, a, a betting, a betting uh, DAP, where you need to store some images or the description of the bet on IPFS and you want to create a, a prediction market on Augur to, to represent the bet. So this contract would connect to the Zeppelin OS marketplace to hire, to hire uh, IPFS to store the files and to hire Augur to create the prediction market. Uh, this could be, this is a really simple example, but a, a DAP that wants to interact with two other DAPs has no way at the moment, no, there's no standard and no tools to enable these kind of interactions um, in an easy way. So the marketplace will, will be just that, like the standardization and the tools to enable contracts to, to pay for each other's services. It involves like a, reg a registry where contracts can uh, publish their services or off make their service offerings and define the payment schedule they they require to access those services. For example, um, a per call payment or a one-time payment, and you can access to all my services or a monthly payment. Uh, and that's, that's how the marketplace would work. Okay, and, and, and but so in the example of Filecoin, right? Filecoin is its own, it's gonna be its own blockchain and stuff. So that's not a smart, yeah. so how would that work? Would you have to have some kind of, I don't know, link smart contract on the yes. Ethereum chain that? Yes, exactly. Like at the moment, uh, given that the marketplace doesn't exist, uh, existing smart contract applications would have to be sort of proxied to the marketplace. And we're planning to write those applications ourselves first. 
like to, to enable existing smart contract applications to interact in the marketplace. So it's, it's easy for us to write an application that just receives payment through the marketplace and just reroutes the, the service request to the, to the other net, network. Uh, but eventually our, um, our plan is for new, new applications to be developed directly on top of the OS, which will enable them to participate in the, in the marketplace natively. Okay. And so I imagine this in the end, you will have almost like a, a registry of, okay, all these, it's almost like an API call registry, right? Like all of these functionalities are available. Like here's how you call them. Here's how much it costs. Exactly. And, and then that happens via open Zeppelin and you guys, so, so you can just kind of simplify the developer experience. Exactly. Yeah. And I also need to like a uh, disclaimer here is that given that this, this uh, component of the OS is so far in the future, like we still, this is our uh, sort of intention of what we want to build. But as with Open Zeppelin, the approach we try to take is to listen to the actual community needs. And we think this, this need will arise, but uh, the, the guiding principle will always be what the industry needs. So we see that the kernel is uh, greatly needed today. That's why we started working with that. Um, and after that, we know that there are many things in the smart contract development experience that could be improved. Uh, but if two years from now, we see that the marketplace uh, was uh, not a very good idea and that we have a, another more important thing we need to be working on, that's what we, we will do. Like the, the, the objective of Zeppelin OS is to improve the smart contract development experience to make it easier and more secure for people to develop smart contracts. So one of the, of the ZEP token or the Zeppelin token, right? One of the use cases then would be that, okay, let's say I, I'm developing an application and I'm calling a bunch of different smart contracts that each have their own token and they expect to be paid in their own uh, token that instead of somehow having to acquire each token, that smart contract could just maybe hold Zeppelin tokens and then pay uh, kind of the Zeppelin smart contract, presumably in, in that token. And then you guys would also build some kind of marketplace so that gets uh, exchanged for those other tokens. Yes. Part of the marketplace, uh, idea is to provide better payment mechanisms for smart contracts. Uh, we are assuming here and this, uh, again, we don't know what will happen, but it seems that future smart contracts applications will each have their own native token. And this is what we see now. And we think this will happen in the future too. Uh, so part of the service provided by the Zeppelin OS marketplace is better ways uh, for these contracts to pay each other in their own native currencies. And we have uh, some different approaches. We, we think uh, we, we want to build to tackle this, this payment problem. Uh, one is, as you said, uh, making the on-chain exchanges. Uh, we, we will probably use existing decentralized exchanges like 0x to do that. Uh, but also there are some other ideas where parties can hold a buffer of tokens and provide these, these exchanges uh, really fast without the need of a market, uh, which we think could be more efficient and, and, and better for some use cases. Uh, and even like a third method would be just to act for each uh, contract to accept SEP tokens. So we just do the, the price conversion. Uh, so a contract can state, uh, can like denominate their services in any currency, but then they can actually settle the payments with any other currency. So they don't need to do the conversion and they, co they can convert manually every month or every every time the, the contract owner wants. But uh, the, the objective of the marketplace is to build these tools to enable contracts to do these payments more easily. So we were talking briefly before about the ZEP token and you mentioned you guys are not doing a token sale, which is uh, you know, unusual in this day of um, the industry. So what are your plans? How are those going to get into the hands of people 
um, you know, that you need when, when this actually launches on mainnet Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Yes, we will eventually sell tokens because we need the developers and actual users of the kernel to hold SEP tokens to participate in the governance mechanism of the upgrades and to, to fund their applications using the marketplace. Um, but we decided not to do a, a crowd sale uh, because with, with our work, with our clients, and also by just looking at the, at the industry, we saw that there's, it's a, like a double-edged sword when you, when you do a crowd sale. You get access to a, a lot of funding, but uh, we also saw that many times the communities become very focused on, on the economics or, or, or on the trading aspect of the token. Uh, so we didn't want to have our Slack filled with traders talking or, or pressuring us to get listed on, on an exchange or to focus on, on the investment side of the token until we have an actual product that works. Uh, so our plan is to actually build a, a working prototype of, of the kernel, which gives utility to the SEP token and only then uh, offer the token as as a, in a sale to the general public. And even like, even when we have a working prototype, we are not sure when we want to open the, the token sale to anyone. Like we first want to focus on the projects that are going to use the, the product, the, the kernel. Uh, so initially we will probably sell uh, directly to projects that want to use the upgradeability kernel. Uh, we, we don't have any, any plans or, or concrete dates on, on when we want the general public to access the, the tokens. Um, and we, we want to be very cautious in this because we think that uh, it's, it's tempting to try to get a lot of money from the community and, and get a, lot, a, a big community behind you, but it also has lots of risks. Uh, I mean, not only legally, but also like uh, uh, with what I explained about uh, the community shifting heavily towards the trading part uh, and, and not focusing on the technology you're building. So we, we will delay uh, the, the public uh, sale of the token as much as we can. Yeah, and of course you, you know, pointed out before the functionality initially of this token is to, to kind of vote on the upgrades of these kernel contracts and and so if you have to choose between two different versions of the contract, I mean, most cryptocurrency investors don't have the knowledge nor interest uh, in being able to do that, right? So you're really going to have a very, very small number of you know, potential parties that can actually make informed decisions there and are also going to be willing to, to even uh, spend the time on that. Exactly, yes. That's also another, another reason. Um, and just in, in general, we think that creating a, like doing a crowd sale before having any product, like makes your project public from day one. And that has a lot of cost for, for the team because you need to communicate and you need to have a very detailed plan on how you want to spend the funds from day one, because you will have to be held accountable to the huge community of people that trusted your money on your project and we prefer a more uh, iterative approach uh, where we have maybe more control from the beginning and can still build things that add value to the community but we don't necessarily have to explain everything we do to the whole investor community and that will give us more fle flexibility in the beginning i think Cool. No, that makes perfect sense, Manuel. So what's, what's the roadmap? Like, when are you going to launch on the mainnet and w which parts of this plan do you think are going to get or become available at what, at what timeline? Yes. So the, we're planning to launch a, a very early prototype of the kernel actually next week. But this is just like a micro kernel version of just an upgradable token. You can, you can check online our, like we started development of Zeppelin OS in a repo, a repo we called Zeppelin OS Labs. 
because it's all very experimental code. Uh, and we called it labs so that people don't use it in production yet, just yet. Uh, but we are launching this, this initial version of the upgradable ERC20 token, which is something that is uh, like a very simple use case of uh, an upgradability mechanism. It's, uh, it's, it, it's not, it doesn't include the token-based governance yet. It's just a, like a centrally governed uh, upgradability mechanism. But uh, we, al we already have projects that want to use it. We're wor working with the Winding Tree team and they're launching their, their token this week. And they want to use this upgradability mechanism for their own token because uh, they want to be able to fix bugs in production once they once they launch um, and after we have this uh, initial ERC20 upgradable ERC20 version we're working on on a more on a on a bigger bigger version of the kernel and we think we'll have uh, the whole open Zeppelin library migrated into on-chain library form with token based uh, governance upgradability by the second half, like by mid 2018. So in five months, that's what we're aiming for. Um, after that, we will continue working on, uh, this, this would be like the MVP for the kernel uh, with uh, token governance. And after that, we're planning to work on other uh, less core features of the kernel this year in the second half of the year which are uh, like creating bug bounties or, or enabling token holders to vouch for future versions. So it's, it's a way uh, for users of the kernel to signal they want to fund development of uh, new features even before they are built. Uh, another other uh, less core mechanics of the kernel, uh, you, can, you can read about them on, on our white paper. Uh, and next year we're working on DSDK, uh, which will be a lot of work. And after that, we're focusing on the marketplace on the third year. That's the plan for now. But I, I want to add again that the disclaimer that we want this to be a, a community-driven effort. So we will follow what the what the industry needs. And fortunately, uh, from our work with Open Zeppelin, we have access to lots of teams building smart contracts. So we are already collaborating with other teams on the, on the code and on the direction of the project. Cool. Well, Manuel, thanks so much for coming on. This was uh, super interesting to learn about the Open Zeppelin and what's coming up here. I think this is a very interesting approach to building uh, smart contracts. And, and I'm curious if things are going to go that way, but it certainly sounds like a, a good and coherent thesis. <laughs> okay. Thank you for inviting me. I, I had a great time once again. And, and so if people want to get involved in Zeppelin, of course, we'll have links to, I mean, both Zeppelin, you know, Open Zeppelin and Zeppelin OS, and we can link to GitHub. Is there any other ways people uh, or things, resources people should check out? No, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I also mentioned our blog, which has lots of content uh, just to, to learn Ethereum from the basics and also some more advanced stuff on how the the OS will work and on smart contract security. Uh, we have a pretty big uh, community on Slack in our open sampling Slack. Um, and we're also hiring. So if everything I talked about really excited you, you can contact us to work with us and help us from the inside. Cool. Well, again, thanks so much, Manuel. It was a pleasure. And thanks so much for a listener for once again tuning in. If you want to support the show, you can do so by leaving us an iTunes review. And otherwise, we're going to be back next week. So thank you and see you then.